in the community are going to be aware of. Um, Howard's been around the Biz Talk space for a long time now, and of particular interest is um, Howard's experience in HL7. Um, I've seen Howard sort of talk and blog about that a few times in the past. So um, back at the Integrate Summit, um, when I was trying to reach out to find people who would potentially present, Howard was um, was really keen to sort of share some of his experience, and in particular about HL7 Fire, which is you know one of the newer things in the in the healthcare space. So hopefully that's going to be a, um, an area of interest to all of us. Um, just before we get into the presentation, just really want to do a shout out about a couple of things. So firstly, um, the Biz Tournament, and that's you know one week closer to the summit now. So if you like the content of Integration Monday, and you can get to London on the 13th and 14th of April, then there's a couple of days worth of really good content. And um, a lot of the sessions we're doing on Integration Monday are leading up to that event. Um, next, just a quick shout out about sort of interacting with each other for the user group events. So if you go onto the user group website, you'll see there's a link for the live discussions, which is where we'll um, we'll put a, a sort of um, page there for anybody who wants to ask questions that will be kept on that page so people can answer them and talk about them later. We also have the chat window for join me, so if you pop any questions in there as well, um, and at the end of the session, Howard will have a quick look through and just check what, what people are asking, and I'll try and copy any questions off the chat in the website later. Um, otherwise, you know, just the normal stuff around Twitter hashtags, the integration for Monday, what anyone wants to talk about and stuff later on. And um, I guess, finally, just the list of the upcoming events. Next week, we've got uh, Ram Rab, um, Datasoft, who's going to be talking about another another angle on healthcare integration, which um, should follow on quite nicely from this week's session. And then we've got um, Sammy, Tommaso, Dan, and Nino lined up for the next few weeks. And um, that should take us up to the, up to the summit in London, in which and we're going to release a whole, whole load of new sessions that will follow on from that. So at this point, um, firstly, thanks to Howard for offering to present, and I'm going to pass over to him now so we can continue the presentation. Not here. Okay, let's start here a little bit. Let me just pop up presentation here. A little screen sharing. Be where 35 is left. Well, I guess you and some else want to join. Let me just uh, do that. Okay, well, this presentation, or actually, I'm going to call it a fireside chat on uh, this talk on fire it's integrating hl7's newest standard and this standard has been in development uh quite a while and it will be quite a while yet before it becomes a uh, official ansi approved standard a little bit about myself uh, who i am uh i'm employed with cci tech I guess uh, I have a title, but uh, I guess uh, basic responsibility is a chief cook and bottle washer, in essence, in essence, I do everything. I've been working with this talk since 2002. Actually, I found out about it when XML was introduced and Soap on a Rope was uh, brought up. I specialize in healthcare. Um, Healthcare integration. Uh, excuse a little bit uh, stops and I'm seeing the notes pop up on there. 
Uh, I'm an author. I've co-authored three books. Uh, Microsoft BizTalk 2010 Administration Essentials, along with Steve Jan Wiggers, Andres Del Rio, and Jaron Hedricks. Also, the Microsoft BizTalk ESP Toolkit, uh, again, co-authored with Andres Del Rio. And my latest book is HL7 for BizTalk, co-authored with uh, Likis Baharde. Uh, also, let's see, I'm certified with BizTalk 2010. And I've been an MCP since actually 1999. If anybody help needs help, anybody needs help with Win95, uh, I'm the person to see. I'm a TechNet Wiki contributor. I also publish and edit uh, two newspapers, Healthcare Integration Daily and Microsoft Healthcare Integration Weekly. I was an avid blogger, but been very lax lately. It, uh, sometimes you get writer's block or someone beat me to the punch on something. I'm also a gold member of the HL7 organization. And uh, again, a lot of the information we'll be presenting will, is from that organization. I'm a participating member of the HL7 Fire Work Group. Uh, also a developer on the work group of HL7, and uh, some have considered me an HL7 for BizTalk Guru. Now here's something to think about. Someone once asked me why I have two phones. I have a Windows phone and an iPhone 6. And I replied, well, I have two hands. I have two ears. I actually have two brains, a left brain and a right brain. And guess which phone belongs to each brain? That's something to think about. And well, again, one of the biggest issues is with me. Well, come on. There we go. Oh, back we go. Part of the animation didn't come up. I have a very dry sense of humor. Not supposed to show up in here, but uh, I guess I'm not perfect yet, so I miscued that one. We're going to talk about today uh, the agenda. We're going to talk about what is fire. We're going to actually going to do quite a, bit, quite a bit of this uh, talk. Uh, and diving or sort of a deep dive into fire and what it's all about, how it's uh, designed, what it's used for, uh, pretty much the specifics in there. Uh, we will get into fire schemas. We'll take a look at the fire schemas that are provided by uh, HL7 and basically work beautifully with inside this talk. We'll also discover what problems does fire solve and how we can use, basically use those problems for problem solving now. We'll take a look at a patient resource within fire. We will talk about what fire does for BizTalk and touch on basically fire and Azure. What is fire? Well, Fire is, again, the HL7 organization is developing a new standard. It's fast healthcare or health interoperable resources. It's commonly known as Fire and pronounced Fire. It's the next generation standards framework and combines the best features of HL7 version two version three and the CDA product lines. I'm assuming everybody's familiar with this. These lines are, I'm not gonna be able to go in depth and go backwards in history to provide you that information. But FIRE will leverage the latest web standards and apply a tight focus on implementability. This is really critical. 
a tight focus on being able to implement FIRE. What is FIRE? Well, let's take a look at resources. The FIRE specification defines a series of different types of resources that can be used to exchange and or store in order to solve a wide range of healthcare related problems, both clinical and administrative. In addition, the specification defines several different ways of exchanging resources. And you have resource types with a patient, and another type is a prescription. And resources are specifically reusable. They, they contain 80% or what the 80%, what the maximum reuse is, and that's really HL7 score business. It's independent of context, fixed defined behavior and meaning. Resources can reference each other. They're units of exchange, they suggest units of storage for implementation, and they're addressed through HTTP or other methods. A resource has a, an identity, an entity, excuse me, that has a known identity by a URL which can be addressed. It's identified itself as one of the types of resources in the specification. It contains a set of structured data items as described by the definition of the resource type. It contains a human readable XML representation of the, con of the resource. That's very important, human readability, and has an identified version that changes if the contents of the version changes, so the resource changes. Now, it covers all use cases, maybe ever, maybe never. But going on, looking through this, we're going from generic to specific to ensure compatibility and reuse, which is a really good idea. The lower uh, scale on this slide, uh, you stop to standardize. The more flexible is your standard to be used in different contexts. But usually, the more specific standards based upon it will diverge and not be cross compatible. Examples are medication and CDA, the CCD, message based national standards. Fire is very specific. So divergence will only start from that specific level. And hopefully, it's giving a better base of interoperability. In essence, people do not like reusable blocks. Their standards where a prescription remains the same, whether they're using messages, documents, et cetera. The CD and the, and the consolidated CDA is probably popular because it tries to define such blocks across multiple uses, thus going further than the more abstract RIM classes of uh, version two or the CMETs of version three. The 80-20 rule. Fire and HL7 is designed for the 80%, not the 100%. And we only include data elements in the artifacts of 80% of all implementers of that artifact will use a data element. Allow for easy extensibility of the remaining 20% of elements. Last week, uh, Steve Jan talked about extensibility. In HL7 and FIRE, extensibility uh, plays a very important part because you can't always get what you want in the 80%. We have the other 20%. So you allow that 20% allows for extensibility. Now again, uh, often make up 80% of the current specs. 
a vocabulary approach to extension definition. Pavan? Yes. Uh, this is Saravana here. Uh, I think uh, what we are seeing is uh, it's it looks like we it's in a presenter mode. So we are seeing all the additional. Oh, slides. you are? Okay, yeah. so let me uh, hide that. Uh, let's see, display settings. Uh, wait a minute. Let me figure out how to do that. Oh, that's not it. Um, okay, I'll hide presenter view. Is that better? Uh, no, I think we are seeing the PPT now. So if you click on slideshow, let's see how it goes. Yeah, okay. I'm on, actually, I'm, I'm trying to project on a different monitor. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, let me uh, move this down to a, uh, come back off of this to a different monitor. I can figure out how to do it. Well, I thought I was presenting on, on this one monitor. Because, oops, why are we going back? Okay, let's see. Well, probably the best thing is unplug it. <laughs> okay, we'll move down here. I'm going to unplug that. I'm going to unplug that. Okay, so we're in. Can everybody see it now? Uh, it's yeah, okay. okay? It's, much, it's much better. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, you can continue, Howard. It looks looks good to me. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's fine. I apologize uh, for the view. Trying, I've got three monitors here, so trying to figure out which one to show on which monitor is not that easy. <laughs> okay, now again, uh, going forward, again, allowing for easy extensibility or extension of the remaining 20%, which often, make, make, often makes up 80% of the current specs. Vocabulary approach to extension Definition, and let's start talking about resources. Okay, resources are units of storage or transactions. You cannot send partial updates. Now, resources have multiple representations. A resource is valid if it meets these rules a small, logically discrete unit of exchange, has defined behavior and meaning, a known identity location, it's the smallest unit of transport, transaction, and the critical one is of interest to healthcare. Now, again, it's, if it meets these above rules and is represented either in XML or JSON, according to the rules designed, defined in the specifications. No other representations are allowed, but they are not described in this specification. And the most we'll ever see, again, uh, this is in comparison, in version two, resources are like segments. In version three, they're sort of like CMETs. Again, I'm sure everybody's familiar, if you work in the healthcare, what these represent. What isn't a resource? Okay, what is? Non-examples are gender, which is too small, blood pressure, which is too specific, a pregnancy, which is way too broad, and an electronic health record, which is too big. Examples are administrative. Administrative uh, resource, we would have a patient, a location, a counter, 
organization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Clinical concepts: so we have allergy intolerance, questionnaire observations. Infrastructure would contain specifically a document, a message, a profile, or conformance. And what a resource is basically the structure of a resource. Well, I got this animation is off a little bit, so we'll have to play it in reverse. The resource is embedded into metadata. A resource will contain, or excuse me, can contain, I'm sorry, resource must contain a narrative. A resource can contain extensions. Resources have elements, and elements can have extensions. So just to review this, a resource is embedded into the metadata. And specifically, uh, let's say the header of the message, the overall scope of the message. Within the resource, we must have a narrative, it must be human readable. We are allowed to have extensions, so it's optional. And of course, elements, zero to unbounded elements. And elements are allowed to have extensions also. And the structure of a resource, this is a good example. And at the top, we see patient. And again, uh, specifically, identifiers all, are all URLs in Fire. So extension reference to its definition, which URLs are, is its definition, and the value code or values renal. And it's human readable summary. And then we have our standard data content, which is the machine readable portion. Again, human readable. The CDA taught HL7 a very important lesson. Even if the computers don't understand 99% of what you are seeing, that's okay. That really is. If they can properly render it to a human clinician. And really, what is, uh, who's the, the source, reader? Who is the out? Where is this going to? It must be human readable. So that's really the critical factor there. Now, this doesn't hold true for documents. It's important for messages or services. A document doesn't have to be human readable. A message doesn't have to be, or a service doesn't have to be. In FHIR, every resource is, re is required to have a human readable expression. Again, resources. It can be direct rendering or human entered. Now the resources in the specification, basically, we're going to, let's take a look at some of these resources in the spec. References versus composition. References are in between resources. They have no context conduction across references. There's three safe retrieval of individual resources. Composition is within a resource. Components have no meaning outside the resource, no identity, no separate access path, except through the resource. A diagnostic report is basically, this is a reference. And in this reference, basically, we have a reference is not a business key. It's not the patient ID. It's a rest URI. And it refers to, there's no referential integrity references. They're just 
URLs. Here's an example, another part of our diagnostic report in XML. Again, uh, we have a status. We have an issue. And if you know the, uh, look at the timestamp there, specifically fire requires the time zone value. Again, the reason for this is because a patient can, or its data, a patient's data, a patient's information can be stored in multiple time zones or can be gathered at different times in different time zones. So it's critical to have the complete time, date time stamped within there. Now, here we have a subject, we have a reference, which is a patient too. We reference an organization. We display it. We have a system identifier. Again, the system is the URL and the value within that URL. Now, basically, resources are not high hierarchy. As you see here, a patient episode, 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 visit, observation, or order. A resource is not an electronic version of a patient file. A resource is basically a part of the whole. It's a separate entity in itself. And looking again at the composition of a resource, uh, a medication dispense resource, and again, we can see a substitution, a dispenser, and dosage. This is the resource route, the medication dispense. The resource component is dispensing of that resource. And specifically, the elements are simple and complex. They can be repeating as codable concept you see here. In composition, going back to there, we see dispense. And we see a status, which again, uh, there's various status identifiers, again, enumeration for that. And we see the quantity, which are simple value and number of units, the system that's used, very simple, units of measure, organization, and a code, which is milliliters, milliliters, one that was prepared, one that was handled over. Now, resource aggregation. How do we know when an object made up of other object begins and ends? In version two, in version three, basically, basically the CDA, the CCDDA, it's uh, quite specific, but sometimes difficult to discover. In any system with persistence of storage of data, there must be a scope for a transaction that changes data and a way of maintaining the consistency of data. This is a very important concept. It's comparable with the aggregate notion of domain-driven design for which, of course, many useful information strategies have been documented. Business identifiers. Resource IDs. Resource IDs equal URLs. They're infrastructure IDs, and they actually difference, differ from business identifiers. Many resources will also contain or have business identifiers that are explicitly modeled, like patient.identifier, and even have more than one identifier, like patient.identifier.identifier2, and such like that. Business identifiers are completely separate from the technical resource IDs. The technical resource IDs are basically GUIDs. A resource identity, 
is in fact, as I mentioned, a URL. It has an endpoint. It has a resource type and has an identifier. Now, this is not the only URL used to retrieve the resource. It's also an ID. And all URLs in Fire are case sensitive, and so is the ID. It's basically the metadata you won't find in the resources definition. Now, resource metadata. Hmm. Mickey Rodent in Orlando. Hmm. I wonder about that one. We're looking at here basically resource metadata. This is behind the scenes, basically behind the resource. So the resource identify identities, which again is using fire org patient and then a patient identifier and the patient identifier with the history and maybe history for uh, last updated date and of course uh, tags and tag profiles. This all make up the resource metadata. The current resource list, now this list is the one that's currently uh, under basically development. It's, for, uh, it's actually part of the uh, DSTU2, which is uh, going to be voted upon at the next working group meeting in uh, May in uh, Paris. As you can see, there's quite a bit of, of resources, and resources are added, uh, and specifically, in, there's additional ones that are not in, listed in this, but they're currently under uh, discussion, under build. Now, again, we have clinical, which is uh, as general as a data collection, care, and plan, medication, immunization, and nutrition, diagnostics, administration. You know, going back to version two ADT, we have a patient, a related patient, a person, who can't talk there, person, a practitioner, or organization, a healthcare service, and entities, workflow management, and scheduling and ordering. Now we also have financial. Now, again, in the US, we're I'm from, financial is not used, we use HIPAA instead. But, but throughout the rest of the world, uh, and what I've discovered from uh, discussions with other people, I know in Canada, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's at least three different uh, specifically um, APIs for handling financial support. The whole premise is to bring all these different ways of handling financial transactions into under one umbrella, and FIRE is the whole basis for that. So we're able to, to handle coverage, eligibility, enrollment, reversal, status, uh, claims, vision claims, payment notice, and explanation of benefits. We also have infrastructure support for media, basic, providence, uh, security events, lists, message header that are part of the exchange and documents and structure, a bundle. And a bundle is basically a bundle of, uh, of fire messages, of uh, JSON or XML uh, posts or we have conformance. Uh, servers specifically will publish a conformance document. And that document is searchable and it describes what that server is conforms to, what it basically will do, what it can't do, what it contains, and how to access that server. In essence, it's uh, like extracting metadata or like a WSDL in, in, in some respect. 
And a patient resource is to pull one up here so everybody can see that. We start at the top of the hierarchy and we start with identifier, which is an identifier of this person as a patient. We have a name, a telecommunication, and gender. Uh, we're still working on uh, administrative gender. So male, female, other, or unknown. I guess a Martian could be unknown, or whatever, if the case may be. A birth date and a birth time. Birth time is very critical. Uh, again, uh, in the case of uh, uh, twins, uh, at birth, and that essentially, the multiple births, you record the birth time, but in essence, the patient or the patient identifier is still the mother until those infants uh, reach a certain maturity or basically in essence. And I'm not too sure on what the uh, clinical terminology is for that. But we have address. We have, again, marital status. Photos, photos of images of the patient. And we have contact information relationship, names, telecommunications. A patient could also be an animal, basically a veterinary science, or even in research or lab work, the communication methods. We have care providers, and of course we have managing organizations. And a patient resource, Looking at it, we look at an XML template and a JSON template side by side. You see they're very compatible, basically, and somewhat easier to understand. We have the cardinality identifier, uh, a little detail about it, and they're interchangeable. So, in essence, we can receive a, a JSON message or an XML message. And they're basically handled and processed the same way. Of course, now underlying each, we have the UML diagram, if you want to get down, deep down and technical about it. A message header text, this is like an example. And let's take a look at this so I can, I don't know why it's showing up as a Python language, but this is a little plugin I found from for PowerPoint. We have a message header. We have a div, a div here, so we have plain text available for that. Identifier, timestamp, code value, a response, source, the destination, and the author and specifically data, what we're referencing in this particular message. The patient resource example, human readable, this is a narrative for a resource. This is something that, again, the machine is not interested in, but the clinician, the doctor, the laboratory, the patient themselves is very much interested in knowing and reading. And again, we have a patient resource example. We have text, basically, which is human readable, identifiers. Again, this is a system value. That's a static value. We have a label, start date display name, identifier. We have a name, again, it's official name and the family, a given, two given values because you can have two parts to the first name. There's also a middle name, middle initial available. And we have a name, a usual, like to be called Jim, telecommunication. So value is home and the system, and uh, again, uh, 
use value, the but telecommunication. Well, I guess there we go. I, I apologize. We have home communication details are not known, but we have a use of home. We have birth date value, and we want to know if the patient is a C's. We have an address type, postal code. And as you can see, it's very easy to read. So it's very simple. And not as complex as working with version two or version three. There we go. Extensibility. Hmm. This head is very extensible, I guess, in this respect. I don't know if I get to my notes. There we go. Extensibility. Extensibility, an extension. This is a typical structure, or actually the structure, of an extension. It's very simple. One to one cardinality on the X element requires a URL, but doesn't require a value. It's optional. And below it is an XML template, which we would use. Uh, in this case, it's a uh, namespace identifier, is a URL, and from the element, the value. Again, is zero to one cardinality and the value of the extension, the name there. Here's some extensions, uh, basically examples. A name extension with the URL, a value code, and a text value, which again is, uh, in essence, it's human readable, or it's just a text value. And JSON, uh, JSON, its extensions are represented differently, as you can see. So we have uh, the name, the value code within the name, and again, outside the extension is a text value. Uh, how Fire uses RESTful principles to communicate the resources. I've noticed one thing, if you stare long enough at that figure with the phone there, the phone starts swinging. Uh, I'm not going to wait around and see, but uh, you're welcome to come back and take a look at that. What it is, basically, in JSON, it's a simple get, quick get. It's an HTTP verb plus a path. It's UTF encoded. Now, of course, this presents a problem from some systems, but BizClock uh, can accept a UTF encoded message and uh, handle it properly. Uh, again, in a lot of coded uh, systems, they have more of an issue of uh, translating it or handling it that way. And, of course, you can see the byte order mark, which we need to take care of. And basically, uh, it pretty much automatically uh, handled within BizTalk, at least with the uh, current schemas uh, that are used or provided for BizTalk. REST representations. We have a GET which is a fire patient. And then we have specifically uh, your question mark. The format is JSON. And the application, the application is JSON plus fire. Now, JSON plus fire or XML plus fire are the only basically types that can be used, content types. An application JSON plus fire, that's the only one supported. 
So let's take a look at these operations in the specification. Mapping to verbs. The create interaction creates a new resource in the server assigned location. It's performed by an HTTP post as uh, shown below. We have the service URL, the resource type, and the format, uh, again, the MIME type. A read operation access the current resource contents. It's performed by a GET. An update creates a new version of the existing resource or creates a new resource if that resource doesn't already exist or the given ID. It's performed by a put operation. And of course, delete. And uh, this is one to be careful with. Removes an existing resource. Once the resource is gone, it's gone. And it's not uh, something you have to take lightly. Patient searching. How are we searching for patients? You have common parameters that are fairly specific, but a patient can be searched by uh, with your paths on the right. Patient.address by active. We want to know, first of all, if that patient is active in the system. I mean, why go get the data if that patient is no longer active? So maybe we'll do a, a search if the patient is active. And at the same time, if the patient is active, uh, get the information. Uh, we can search on family name, gender, uh, as many parameters as required in order to get the information required returned to us. Adam and Jason. Now, oh, here's the issue. There really isn't a good way to render Adam and JSON. There are initiatives, and they're pretty ugly, some of them. Well, all of, my, all of them, I would say, from what I've seen. So we had, unfortunately, to roll our own. And we need a very straightforward and single purpose. And we came up with an Atom JSON solution. By we, I mean the HL7 development team, the, pretty much all the work groups working together with an HL7. Now, if you note, the mind type is still application JSON. So that doesn't change. And here's a fairly nice example, very clean looking. A JSON atom. Again, we come up with a, you know, as a side note here, this kind of reminds me of JavaScript in a way, if you look at the way it's uh, pretty much designed, but quite a bit different. Sometimes I wonder if JSON was patterned after uh, JavaScript. And let's take a quick look at data types. We have composite data types and primitives. Again, this goes back to version two, the version three, the CDA, the consolidated CDA, but they're improved upon and specifically weeded out of some of the fat, let's, let's put it, the fat involved or fat within there, the un use portions of it. So we have like the composite, the human name, a quantity, a period, address, identifier, constraint types, the quantity. Then we still have primitives and we have derived primitives. So OID, a UUID, a code and an ID. And some coded types here, coding values and codal concepts. So codes are identified in code systems. Now, fire again, all these code systems are provided within different resources or within uh, basically tools provided to us. So we can easily abstract that system 
value and the code value to generate our outbound messages. And some coded types. When used in a resource, again, the modelers include bindings, not like we have in BizTalk. But bindings specify which codes can be used. And we can see the type of binding and the reference. Again, everything is a URL. We don't have to worry about these codes or, or GUIDs or unreadable items that uh, or OIDs or such like that that we have in version three. We have plain, simple English references. So a reference now, we know that this is an observation interpretation by its ID identifier there. Narratives. Narratives, again, play a very important part. Now, one of the biggest issues that I have discovered and uh, trying to work with are narratives, is how to generate narratives. Again, the biggest issue is the information needs to come from the clinician, whoever is providing the data or writing out the data. And it has to be inserted within our messages unaltered. So specifically, as we see, are pre-formatted here. Question is, is where is this stored? Are you storing it in a database? Are you storing it in documents? So again, it's a combination of, uh, and again, this is not limited just to work with in this talk, it's with any system. While we're used to pulling data uh, directly from uh, other messages or from relational databases, uh, we sometimes maybe have to go back and maybe have another look and look at uh, uh, the flat file databases, like uh, uh, several of them out there. So again, what we have is we have a status, which is a generated text. And this report is a final report and the issued date of the report. And again, this must be included or must be in part. You can have only the narrative and the message is valid. It doesn't have to be machine readable. Again, it's what you're doing with it, where you're sending it, where it's going. So let's take a look at uh, the fire schemas that we have here. Let me pull up. I pulled the fire schemas and they're all available for download. There's no cost. They're easy to access on the fire site. And I'm gonna just gonna pull up or open up uh, a fire atom schema. And that since this is a feed, now it's identified. We have room for signature, object key information for specific security reasons. We have a title, which again could be anything. We need to know if it's updated as attribute. We have an ID. We have a link. An author, again, very information. Category. Entry. Within the entry now, we have, again, title, link, author, category, but we have content. And all the fire schemas that you see in the project make up the atom feed, basically. Now, they're not all required. You can have none. You can have one. But this is the type of message that would be coming into BizTalk. 
are basically that we get in a response coming back from a fire server or from another, uh, another source. Let's take a closer look at our one resource. And uh, again, I shouldn't say resource, these are schemas. Schemas are not resources. They're derived from resources. Let's just take a look at the patient. Patient there, there we go. I hope everybody can see the small print on here. So a patient consists of an identifier. Then we have sequences that allowable extensions. We have an extension, a modifier extension. Again, these are all optional. But the, what we're after is the last sequence here and what it contains. We have an identifier, we have a sequence. Uh, here's a name within the name and identifier, but we can also have an extension. So what kind of, what's the use of the name? And what's nice about it, all we need is an identifier and a value. We don't need all these old codes that we had to deal with in version three or the CDA or going backwards. And just a little side note, Fire is backwards compatible. And it does map very nicely to version 2x, version 3, or, or specifically any of the uh, Fire, or rather uh, HL7 the, the standards. A text, again, this would be the text value. We have a family, we have a given name with an ID, a prefix, a suffix, and the period. Basically, one is that start and end. Very simple. So, getting a name information, telecommunication information. Very easy to work with, as you can see. Sequence. We have a coding for the gender and just plain text to spell it out. Birth date values. When deceased, an address, use, county, state, period, and everything that, that we need, marital status, text or a coding value which would have specifically more information. Choice, we have multiple births or the number of births. Photos, contact information, animal communications, care provider, managing organization, a link, well, a link to specific information, and most important, is it active? It's a Boolean value, something to check first. And again, this can all be handled within a, basically a query operation to a fire server or to another system. Now, besides patient, we can have other Let's say we want the family history. So coming back to family history here, we have identifier, subject, reference and display values, any notes, and the relationship. Again, Everything is well documented within the schemas. Makes it very easy to work with. So what else besides do we have for patient? Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, related persons. Everybody has relations, one type or another. 
So we need to know if we have a related person. A patient could be related, could be also related. What relationship, the name, telecommunication, even a photo. Fire also supports the use of media. So we can have specifically in a case um, diagnostic information uh, coming across and as basically x-rays. Uh, DICOM support is actually a, let's see if I have it here. Uh, we have binary, support for binaries, the content type and the ID. And we have media again, other patient. Even security events. Now, security events are actually very important. Whether or not who has access to what contained within the patients or with a document or specifically the message. Who can read what, what kind of events, the participants that have the source, and particularly the objects. So this could all be set and configured here. So, and can be, again, as I mentioned before in your JSON um, post, going back to our Adam, excuse me, not JSON, but our Adam, this is a single, so just put single feed. In our feed, we can have multiple, one or more of each, and specifically it supports everything that's uh, available in the current uh, version of this, and as we go forward within Fire, We'll be adding more to it. Now, let me just go back to the uh, slide presentation. And we just took a look at schemas. Uh, this is so much easier to do on two monitors or three, but now I got I to gotta wing it because I can't see my notes anymore. <laughs> but I know pretty much all of this by heart. So the fire, HL7 family and fire, what problems does it solve? Well, in version two and fire, we have similarities. In version two, it's built around reusable chunks of data that have strong forward back compatibility, rules and extensibility mechanism. But in fire now, the difference is each chunk resource is independently addressable. And you, you saw that chunk or a resource as it is within, used within BizTalk schema is independent. It's more than a message. It's, it's human readable is required. Extensions don't collide. You're not going to have the same duplications. They're discoverable. They're versionable. They're modern tools and skills, and instances are very easier to read and has a lighter spec. In version three, version three was based upon the RIM vocabularies and the ISO data type foundations, and of course supported XML syntax. The fire differences, there are simpler models and syntax, the reference model is hidden. We don't have to worry about that. Their friendly names are easy to understand. You don't have to be guessing or going and having to look up this 
code or this thing or that thing. Again, extensibility with discovery. Easy intervision wire compatibility. And messages, documents, ETC, everything uses the same syntax. Of course, we have JSON syntax. The CDA and FIRE. Now, the CDA provides support for profiling for specific use cases. Human readability is, is minimum for, for some operability, provided APIs, validation tooling, and profiling, and it's very similar to version three. The FIRE differences are in comparison. You can use it right out of the box, and no templates required. It's not restricted to just documents. Implemented tooling is generated with a spec. And again, uh, version three on the prior slide, you can go back to that for the comparison. Now let's take a look at the patient resource, which we actually did. I kind of jumped ahead, but um, we're gonna go back in here. And we'll skip, I guess time-wise, I'm kind of running over, but maybe I can steal some of the time that Steve Jan left from last week, and hopefully no one will bail out on me. I have a little quiz here. Hmm. How can we use FIRE now? Let's see, map, personal health record. Uh, oh, use the canonical scheme. Let's see if that is right. Oh, that's wrong. Let's see, a little bit of hint here. Common scenarios. Ah, multiple days. Again. I know all the above. God, ah, I just passed the test. Something to figure out. Future directions in the fire in Azure. I've been working with FHIR for, I guess, pretty much in depth for, let's say, more than a year and a half now. I've attended um, three connectons, which are held at HL7 meetings. Uh, I guess myself and uh, my co-author, the Vitus, were at the first meeting, and uh, we actually were able to complete a BizTalk application that was able to get patient information from a, a fire server, bring it into BizTalk, split it up, and push it to multiple databases. Also, we're able to combine kind of slicing and dicing resources or messages and Again, send that message out back to the uh, fire server. We did this in under three hours. So it gives you an idea of how easy it is to work with. Again, it depends upon your, your capability level. Again, we're talking about Azure now here. I've been working with Fire with Azure. In fact, I've been working with Fire and trying to use Office 365 and, and uh, CRM as uh, user interfaces to generate uh, uh, patient forms or information forms to send to the BizTalk. Uh, I've created specifically a, a, a service on Fire which integrates within uh, Health Vault and able to, uh, from BizTalk, uh, basically pass my message up to my service up on, on Azure and in essence write to the patient's uh, profile on uh, Health Vault. Uh, I see a lot of interoperability because if you look at Fire and really go through the specification, on the fire site, it's really designed for for basically cloud applications. Uh, it can be used for easily for 
in combination with a basically a grounded uh, BizTalk server. Uh, unfortunately, there is no extensibility for BizTalk services, but I've started researching and I've got a, a, a sort of an API somewhat written uh, that I want to incorporate into a microservice. So able to, in essence, uh, handle pretty much all the operations. I've worked with uh, document DB going back to uh, um, file based uh, data storage. File DB works out very nicely for storing uh, JSON directly, able to also having the ability to perform CRUD operations on JSON. So, again, we can. Established basically using XML, JSON, uh, pretty much any message type. So, again, I'm moving a little forward in that direction. And a little acknowledgments here. The content that I use throughout this presentation is licensed under Creative Commons, so it's no rights reserved. Again, uh, registration of HL7 and HL7 wording and fire are registered trademarks. So I've got the, the lawyers all the way. I can go on a little further. And now I'll go with a little bit of QA. And let me just pop out of this. And I think I have. So I've opened up the blog here. I see everybody leaving. No one wants to stay. <laughs> comments. Okay, comments. Let's see. Refresh. Okay, we'll start at the an hour ago. Share the link. Okay, I'll share the link. Okay, thanks. Okay. More general question from Steve Chan. How does HL7 FHIR relate to other standards like SWIFT and ROSANET? The other standards that have the same or extensibility or something that resembles FHIR. Um, I've worked a little bit with, with SWIFT. I haven't worked with ROSANET. And to be honest with you, I really don't know. But uh, it's a good question. And it deserves an answer. So I'm going to hold off and probably uh, going to answer it, provide you an answer on my blog uh, once I'm able to do a, uh, a valid uh, comparison. But uh, HL7 Fire, again, it's international, it's not specific to one country. It's not limited to specifically, uh, in general, payers or providers. It's also usable by device manufacturers, uh, laboratories, uh, anybody that's or anything that has some connectivity within healthcare. And so I'm, I asked, does BizTalk handle fire with a specific accelerator? Actually, no. There's no accelerator. It's all XML based. The schemas are available, although they do take a little tweaking to uh, get them to work and build uh, within BizTalk. Um, I've got a, another little demo I kind of missed on there, but uh, it's, again, I'll, I'll probably publish more information. And this really gives me uh, some fuel or some uh, information to start blogging again and provide more information. So I'm going to provide it on, on my blog. We got two more comments. 
how do I find the interop between Fire and HL7 version 2? 